good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nazani Rahnavad. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. Um, so a little bit background about myself. I received my PhD from Georgia Tech in 2007, and then I was an assistant professor at Oklahoma State University from 2007 to 2013. I then joined the UCF as an associate professor in 2014. I received NSF Career Award in 2011 and also a CECS Excellence in Research Award in 2020. I direct Communication and Wireless Network Lab, a CW Lab, and our primary uh, area of research is in uh, wireless communication, networking, and also learning. Currently, I have two postdocs, six PhD students, and several undergraduate students working um, in different projects that we have. Um, so in this talk, I will mainly talk about uh, how we can go from big amount of da data to a small amount of the data. And the reason is uh, being that uh, thanks to the rise of all these inexpensive data collection devices and sensors, um, we, we, we can collect a lot of data. And while this is very good, we can do a lot of great um, tasks with this, all this data, but uh, there is a cost associated with the um, communication of this data or storage, processing, or even labeling of this data. So therefore, it's um, very important to somehow we can uh, compress or prune this data to a very small number of uh, good representatives uh, in a way that we get the most information out of this data with the minimum amount of the cost. Uh, the tool that I use uh, for um, delivering this task is uh, a mathematical tool which is called comparative sensing, which is about undersampling the signals which are sparse. Now, sparsity is fortunately a phenomenon which is present in most of the natural signals. For example, if you look at the temperature across the field or if you look at the images, uh, there are some uh, transformation that we can convert these signals to some sparse uh, signals as we can see here. And therefore, this is no surprise that comparative sensing can be applied in uh, many fields for data reduction. And the idea is that um, instead of just sampling all the signal coefficients, let's say x1 through xn, I can um, just do a very simple matrix multiplication and reduce the amount of the data to much smaller measurements. Um, and if you look at here, this is nothing but just a linear combination of, the, of all the signals. So in other words, to just sample all the data points um, individually, I just collectively sample them as a linear combination. And most importantly, or interestingly, this matrix can be even the random matrix, meaning that if I just collect it randomly, uh, add the data together, they are gonna be very good data for us. Uh, we can reduce the number of uh, required data. So this is about the comparative sensing. So my contribution to the field of comparative sensing uh, has been twofold. One it has been in the design of novel comparative sensing techniques and also in the application. This is a part of my NSF career award. Um, so we somehow extended the conventional comparative sensing techniques to the cases that we can um, uh, integrate signal and system properties. For example, if we have a signal that there are some regions of interest for that, instead of just uniformly do comparative sensing, we do non-uniform comparative sensing, or if you have time varying signal, somehow we can get the feedback from the environment and adjust the design of comparative sensing. And uh, uh, the other part of my contribution has been the application. Um, I have explored many applications. Here is uh, energy efficient data collection in wireless sensor networks. So let's say we have thousands of sensors deployed in an area, we would like to get the information, but we don't want to sense every individual sensor. So again, we use comparative sensing, but because here we are also using comparative sensing in a networking setup, we have to be mindful about the networking protocol, for example, routing, MAC layer, or other issues, and we have to have a cross-layer design between different networking layer and also comparative sensing. For example, here we are using a cluster setup, our measurement matrix look like black diagram matrix, very different than the usual comparative sensing, and we have to optimize, let's say, for example, the number of clusters. And um, so um, comparative sensing has application in many, many disciplines. Um, I teach comparative sensing class every year, and usually in addition to EC and CSC students, I have students from MAE, Civil, Engineering, and also Creole. And we already have published five, uh, five papers just from the course projects. So if you are dealing with data, if you are uh, dealing with um, um, somehow collecting the data and you want to look at the energy efficiency, maybe comparative sensing might be a good tool that you can also use in your research. And uh, the result of this uh, basically findings um, led to two other NSF grants. Um, the, this is a grant which is about uh, efficient spectrum sensing. Here we are, we, we would like to sense the spectrum 
uh, very uh, periodically, uh, but the goal is to uh, basically make a um, real-time spectrum map for spectrum usage. And why having a real-time spectrum map is important because then users can look at the spectrum holes and they, they can opportunistically basically share the spectrum and we can tackle the spectrum scarcity. Uh, we are dealing with uh, high dimensional data. We have time, frequency, and space. So we had to also look at uh, high dimensional data analysis like tensor decomposition in addition to comp persistency. We also needed to um, basically develop al algorithm for uh, uh, optimal sensor selection. Here, as we see that the, the environment is changing, the, the transmitters are changing. So we have to, change, to sense the spectrum in different locations at different uh, times. Um, so the other project, um, is a collaborative project with uh, Professor uh, Ron Dimara from ECE, again sponsored by uh, NSF. So here uh, our goal was to develop power and area efficient hardware architectures, uh, mostly for IoT applications. Um, and we integrated the adaptive compressive sensing. Here is uh, showing a design for an analog to digital converter, which uh, uses the uh, adaptive compressive sensing for adaptive sampling rate and quantization level, which also uses the spin based uh, ar architecture that is developed in uh, Professor DeMar's lab. So we have published several in this um, interdisciplinary research, and including a journal um, um, uh, in emerging and selected topics in circuits and systems. So this was a joint work, again, with Professor DiMara between signal processing and also hardware architecture design. And last but not least, uh, I also looked at the um, uh, best representative selection to reduce the number of data. This is a collaborative work, collaborative work with Professor Shah from CRCV, supported by our, our IRPA. And again, the idea is that if you have a lot of data, I would like to just select the best representative that also resides within the data. This is an NP complete problem. However, in our work in CVPR 2019 and 2020, we end up with um, very um, efficient and um, um, simple, or simple in terms of computation and complexity algorithms uh, that uh, we can select the best representatives in linear time. And, uh, it has uh, many, many applications, for example, active learning where we have a database and you don't want to label all the data because it's going to be very costly. So somehow in a feedback loop, we select uh, what are the best data to be uh, labeled in an iterative fashion. This is an example that we showed two, classifi two class classifier trained on all the data, all the labels. And here is our scheme with only using 10 labeled data and compared to other methods that I see the decision boundary here for our case is much closer to the decision boundary of um, when we had the access to all the labels. We can also use this data selection mechanism in uh, data summarization, database summarization, summarize a huge amount of database with just much smaller best representatives, or you can summarize hours and hours of video, just a few minutes of the uh, key basically frames in a video. And um, so, as far as the future plan, uh, I'm, uh, I'm looking at different projects. Uh, one is multimodal data selection, when we are working with different modes of the data with different properties. I'm also looking at the learning under anomaly and adversarial attack. Let's say if you have noisy labels, if you have a Trojan, mod, Trojan AI that uh, and the adversary has changed a stop sign to a speed limit in the labels, and that can make a catastrophe for, let's say, self-driving cars. We are looking at those kind of um, practical and adversarial issues in uh, AI. And also, uh, as a long term, I would like to apply um, this uh, deep learning for wireless communication system, but we definitely need a paradigm shift. We cannot just transfer everything from computer vision to wireless communication because the nature of wireless communication signal is totally different. And we have to look at both data-driven and also model-driven techniques um, to tackle this problem for wireless communications. So uh, at the end, I would like to thank my uh, great team at CWNU Lab, my postdocs, PhD students, and undergraduate students, and also my collaborators, uh, mainly Professor Shah and Professor Gimara, and NSF and IRPA for their support. Um, and uh, thank you very much uh, to Michael and his team for this great opportunity that, uh, to present my research. And uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, very